The Lord be with you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, choir. As you're turning to the third chapter of Exodus, I, there's a line in that song that reminds me of a dear friend and mentor, Hewlett Glower. Uh, Dr. Glower was a New Testament and preaching professor at, Wake, at Truett Seminary. He's retired now. Uh, Dr. Glower, the whole time I knew him, lived uh, sort of with the results of a massive stroke he had had. Uh, couldn't tie a tie anymore, so he wore some turtlenecks to get away with it. And uh, one of the things that was so powerful about Dr. Glower is I remember uh, we had a uh, foot washing service at Truett for the students there, and we all sort of half expected we'd wash each other's feet, but no, it was Dr. Glower who was out use of half of his body, basically, who got down and washed our feet. But Dr. Glower used to always say that if Jesus is anything, he is one who makes a way where there is no way. And that made me think of Dr. Glower this morning, so I'm sure... I'm sure somewhere he's gained a blessing because I'm thinking about it. So, uh, but hopefully you're now in chapter 3 of Exodus. We're going to pick up where uh, Casey left off this morning. In verse 1, reading on through verse 12. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their suffering. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Oh God, you are indeed a way maker, a chain breaker, a pain taker. All the words that were sung this morning, we trust that that is what you are, who you are. And Lord, we also know that you are a present speaker to our hearts. And so Lord, as you are here this morning, speak to us. Help us, Lord, to hear, and not just remember, but hear and be changed by your presence and your words. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So I I wonder this morning, if you've given some thought lately, maybe, to what you're afraid of. Some people are afraid of heights. Just yesterday, Sally and I, for the first time ever, at least for me, went up to see the Vulcan. And, you know, you don't really think about how high up that thing is until you get off the elevator. And, oh my goodness, you can see through the floor all the way to the bottom. If you look up, you get a a revealing look at the Vulcan, let's just say that. (laughs) Some people are scared of heights, never wanting to go more than a few steps up the ladder. Staying away from the windows and the upper floors of an office building, choosing the aisle seat 
on a plane riding the entire time with their eyes closed, a death grip on the armrest. Just get me on the ground, get me on the ground. Others are scared of snakes. That's a common one. Once there was a snake in the middle of the dirt road in front of my dad's house. And so he went inside and grabbed the only gun in the whole place, a single shot twenty two pistol and a handful of shells that he had. And he proceeded to, to walk out to the road a safe distance from the snake, of course, where he would fire a shot and miss and reload and fire a shot and miss. And these repeated attempts to kill the snake. My grandma just down the hill heard the commotion. She came out the screen door barefooted, grabbed a broken pecan limb off the back porch step, walked barefooted right down the middle of the road where she took the wide end of the stick and just mashed the snake's head off. <laughs> then with a flick of her wrist, flicked it into the woods. I remember she looked at my dad, who was just maybe an inch or two shorter than me, but that day I think was a foot shorter. She said to him, you can go on back in the house now, son. Some folks are scared of snakes. Some are scared of spiders, not wanting those eight legs to come anywhere close, hyperventilating whenever they accidentally walk through that nearly invisible web. And then there are the intelligent ones among us who are scared of clowns, and we don't need to say anything else about that. Some folks are deathly afraid of doing what I'm doing right now, speaking in front of people. Jerry Seinfeld, the, the comedian and who knows, maybe philosopher, once noted that there were more people who were scared of public speaking than they were even of dying. He said, according to most studies, people's number one death, fear is public speaking. Number two is death. Death is number two. He asks, does that sound right? This means for the average person, if you go to a funeral, you're better off in the casket than given the eulogy. Some people are afraid to speak. So what are you afraid of? To tell the truth, the thing that really scares me isn't at the top of a ladder. It doesn't have eight legs. It doesn't have scales. It doesn't come with white painted face or a rainbow wig. No, what scares me is the thought, the remote possibility that I could wake up tomorrow morning and the last 20 years of my life would have all been a dream. That I'm 15, having to relive the past 20 years. A story that when I tell it even now, feels like it's someone else's story. To go back, to unwind the clock, to face once again the uncertainties of the road ahead, even if I had the knowledge that it can and will likely all shake out right in the end. That scares me. Frightens me. I wonder if it was frightening for Moses, the call to go back, the call to confront his past. I tend to believe it was. You know, we sometimes forget the details of Moses' story, remembering only the broad sweeping points highlighted in Technicolor by Charlton Heston and Cecil B. DeMille. Yes, Moses was placed on the water in a basket, but the word is actually ark. We'll, we'll talk about that some other time. Placed on the water by his sister as an infant to protect him from the order of Pharaoh. Yes, he was drawn out of the water. He was Moshe'd, Moses, out of the water by Pharaoh's daughter, taken into her home. But he was nursed by his own mother, raised knowing his Hebrew heritage which would have made all the, been all the more obvious as he grew up and he looked less and less Egyptian and more and more Hebrew. It's why we heard in the text read earlier that one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk, he knew it was, and he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses knew who he was, the people from which he came. So when he goes out one day as a grown man and sees an Egyptian beating one of his own people, Moses murders the Egyptian, buries his body in the sand. And I suppose he believed he had gotten away with it. Because we're told he went out the next day, the next day, 
He saw two Hebrews fighting, and he said to the one who was in the wrong, Why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He buried the dead Egyptian in the sand and apparently slept soundly that night. Woke up the next morning. He was under the impression no one knew what he had done. And he got up and when he saw these Hebrews fighting, decided he would be the voice of reason in the midst of the conflict. But instead, one of the Hebrews asked, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me just like you did that Egyptian? And then the Bible says Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. I mean, he put it behind him just a day ago. But the jig is up. The cat's out of the bag. Moses had been seen. He looked this way and that, but not enough. And what's more, those who had witnessed what he'd done, well, now they were spreading the word. And it wasn't just the Hebrews, because we're told when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. Now, why did Moses, the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, try to hide his sin? Why wouldn't he just run to the palace? I mean, get out of his bedroom and run down the hall to Pharaoh and throw himself at his feet and say, my, my granddaddy, I did something bad. I did something wrong. Surely this thing would be found out. It's sand. You ever tried to bury something in the sand? It doesn't stay buried long. Surely Moses' crime couldn't go unnoticed. Surely somebody would be missing their brother, their husband. Their son? He had to know that, right? He had to know that this sin he committed wouldn't stay hidden long. But then again, it is our darkest sins that we believe go unnoticed, isn't it? It's those, those sins we keep to ourselves, those that we believe will never see the light of day, the, the vision of others, that we are somehow able to carry with us, just tuck it down in the deep, dark corners of our souls and carry on as if nothing has changed, nothing is different, out into the full light of day, hiding it in our hearts, in the convenient sands of the past, maybe. But even those sins are found out. For the root of sin is our selfishness, a selfishness that denies our culpability, a selfishness that clings to our own claims of innocence, a selfishness that seeks to speak over that still, small voice, the call of God. That selfish root of our sin inevitably betrays us. And the sins we believe to be hidden, forgotten, or unknown find their way out of the darkness and into the light. And once there, rather than repentance or sorrow, they create within us the most dangerous of drives. Defense and fear. When Pharaoh hears of Moses' actions, he seeks to kill Moses. So what does Moses do? Does he seek legal counsel? Does he confess and plead for forgiveness? Does he take the punishment that comes from the king of the world? No. We're told Moses fled from Pharaoh. He was afraid and his fear drove him out into the wilderness, eventually far as far as Midian, where he finds himself a new life. It's interesting, we're told he goes to Midian by a well, for those of you who like to read your Bibles and you read the Old Testament, anytime a single man winds up at a well, they're going to play the canon in D in just a little bit longer. Somebody's getting married when a single man winds up at a well. And Moses found himself at a well and eventually married to Zipporah, one of the seven daughters of Ruel, or he's later called Jethro, a priest of Midian. And she bears Moses a son. And Moses gives him this odd name, Gershom. Ger in Hebrew means stranger, foreigner, immigrant maybe. A name that reminds Moses of his present situation as a stranger in a strange land. And so we're told at the end of chapter 2, just two chapters. I remember the Ten Commandments feeling a lot longer than that every time I'd watch it. Two chapters. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. 
The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. And out of their slavery, the cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant. God looked upon the Israelites and God took notice of them. A long time. Moses has been in Midian with his wife, his son, his new family for a long time. Long enough for his sins to be forgotten. Long enough for the Pharaoh who had sought to kill him to have died himself. Moses had seemingly outran and outlived the consequences of his actions. He had successfully run away from it, finding himself settled down, safe, comfortable, secure, and far away from those bloody sands in Egypt. And no doubt, Moses, Moses likely slept in his tent at night with Zipporah and Gershom and his other children and had all but put Egypt his crime, and even his people out of his mind. Until one day, when he was keeping the flock of Jethro, and he led the flock behind the wilderness, beyond the wilderness, and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Just another day, keeping the sheep, A day like many before it, maybe that day, I don't know, Moses decided, let's go on out a little further. Maybe there's a little bit more out on further. But he goes out and winds up at Horeb, also called Sinai in the Old Testament, the mountain of God. It was called the mountain of God because the people of Midian believed that's where God was. It's a common thing in the ancient world to believe that gods resided on mountains. You can't blame them, can you? You'd look up. Yeah, that's a mighty highway up there. I guess that's where God is. I'm not going up there to see if he's there. That's where God is, where the thunderclouds gathered first. That's where God was. Mountains were and are quite intimidating, especially when cast against the arid landscape of Midian. So when Moses approaches Horeb, he knew he was approaching the mountain of God. And maybe that's why when he looks and sees a bush that blazes but is not burned, a a burning bush that's not consumed. Maybe that's why it was so intriguing to Moses. This is the holy mountain of God, not someone's front yard where they're burning leaves in the ditch. This is the mountain of God. I need to turn around and see what this is. So most of us, we know the rest of the story, don't we? Moses said, I must turn aside, look at this great sight, see why the bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush. Said his name twice to make sure he heard it. Moses, Moses, here I am. Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face. Why? Because he was afraid to look at God. It turns out that this bush that blazes but isn't consumed is God. God's conduit, the presence of God. And through it, God calls to Moses. And Moses has this close encounter of the divine kind. And I suppose for all the fear that it raises in him still, there is a sense of awe and wonder To climb to the top of the mountain with shaky knees and to look down at the great height. There might be fear, but there's still a sense of awe and wonder. To be in the presence of God, to hear this voice calling from this miraculous sight on the mountain of God, no less. Sandals and shoes are too profane for this moment, for this place, and Moses' face too unworthy. It is the very presence of God, and Moses has been called out by name. This isn't, hey, you over there, Moses, Moses. It's a rapturous moment indeed. But this divine voice that calls to Moses is not just the miraculous product of space and time, not the affirmation of a moment of worship. This is the call of God. And God has a word, a hard word for Moses. I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cries 
from Egypt. Go, I'll send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. I don't doubt that as soon as God mentioned the word Egypt, that Moses' heart began to beat just a little bit faster. His palms began to sweat, his knees weak. Egypt? They know what I did there. My face is still on the wall at the post office. Egypt? Surely, surely by now, they've forgotten about it, right? I mean, Egypt. Would they still, would they still say what they said all those years ago? Who made you ruler and judge over us? You're going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian? I don't doubt Moses. Whew. To go back. To go back to Egypt was to go back to face his past, his sins, his reputation. All that he had sought to leave behind, all that he had run from out of fear, all that he had hoped was lost and forgotten. But Moses still, God calls him out of the bush. I'll send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, your people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Can't you just hear the shakiness in Moses' voice when he says, uh, uh, but, but who, who, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? This isn't Charlton Heston. This is a man afraid. Maybe it's humility, but maybe more so it's the response of a man who had hoped to never face his sins again. The question of a man whose past had just now, just finally slipped off the table, only to be picked up off the floor and set right in front of him once more. Pharaoh, Egypt, surely they'd remember. Surely there was a widow and fatherless children who would remember. Surely they'd be waiting. Surely his sins were not as far as he had hoped they would be. But even so, God calls and God says, I will be with you. This shall be a sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you brought those people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. I will be with you. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to live my life on a forward moving rail with little need to go backwards. I like to, to think that the present merely exists as just a step towards the future. So each day becomes what I hope is a higher step towards a better tomorrow. The past is gone, entangled in the fabric of space-time, unreachable from this present moment, guarded by the universal speed limit of light. So I don't worry about the past. And if you believe that, I've got some magic beans I'd like to sell you after church. The past lingers with us. It haunts us. Especially those sins that we believe we buried in its sands. Time and distance only momentarily eases our minds, creating a false sense of security in the present. And just, just when we think we've let it go, just when we believe that we've overcome our own sins all by ourselves, God calls. God calls and we're forced to deal with what we've done, who we were, and who we've gotten to be now. How we've gotten to be where we are now. God calls and those secret sins we believe to be hidden from the rest of the world begin to sift themselves up out of the sand and into the light of day. And it frightens us. It creates within us the anxiety of uncertainty. Because what we had once thought was long forgotten is still very much alive and remembered even, even if it's only within our own souls. But I don't believe that God calls us to confront our pasts to shame us. God doesn't call us to confront our sins to tear us down and leave us wrestling with our own self-worth. 
No, because God didn't whisper those words to Moses, Pharaoh, Egypt, just to watch him squirm in the anguish of an imagined torture and execution. No, God called Moses to confront his past, his sins, so that God could remind Moses, I will be with you. That despite all that Moses was, all that Moses had done, God still called him. No matter the depth and darkness of that sin, God was still calling Moses. And God was still with Moses. God calls us to confront our past so that we may see the goodness of God in our present. So that we may see the depth of God's grace throughout our lives. So that we may know that God is not kept from us no matter how hard we may try to keep ourselves from God. God calls us to confront our pasts. And frankly, it's a disruptive call. Because there's things I've done and the person I was that I don't ever want to think about again. But when I think of them, when God calls me, it's not to feel bad and to shame me, but to remind me that God was with me even then and has brought me this far even now in spite of myself. It's a call that threatens all we've made for ourselves because to go back and to look, man, what if, what if I do it again? What if they remember? It's a call that risks so much. Moses, to go back, what if they remember? But what if Zipporah and Gershom forget? It's a call that could very well end all that we have. And still, it's God who calls. And it's God in that call speaking to us just as He did to Moses. I will be with you. I've always been with you. I will always be with you. So what are you afraid of? If it's something you've long since buried, something you believed was forgotten in the past, know this. God calls you to confront it. And no matter how disruptive it may be for you, may you hear the hope in this. That God promises to be with you in the midst of all of it. For God has always been with you in the midst of all of it. And God will always be with you in the midst of all of it. What are you afraid of? God calls you to confront it even now and to remember and realize that God is with you even so. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Lord, we know that you call us just as you did Moses. You call us, Lord, to confront whatever sins, Lord, are unconfessed, whatever sins we've buried in the past, hoping to forget them, hoping to outrun them. We know you call us to confront them. Not to shame us, not to hurt us, but, Lord, to show us how you are still with us. So, God, now in this time, we listen for your Holy Spirit. God, help us. Give us the courage to face what it is you have for us. To face that to which you call us. Holy Spirit, come and be with us now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.